Week 7 of college football is in the books, but we're going to go back, take a look, see what draft-eligible prospects have helped their stock and hurt their stock. Welcome to the Stock Report on What's crack a It's your boy, Bro Schmo, just in case you do not know. So go ahead, become bro and subscribe. Leave this video a thumbs up if you enjoy the content as always. Let me know what you think in the comment section below where we have that nice, uh, beautiful football discourse. Let's go ahead, get into this sucker, starting with, well, the game that we did a watch-along for on Saturday, being Oregon versus Washington. We're going to be talking about Rome Adunze, the wide receiver from Washington, coming in at 6'3", 215, had one a heck of a game where he had eight receptions for 128 yards, two uh, touchdowns. He has been phenomenal this season, and I think you really have to start maybe put him in the conversation of wide receiver two or three in this class at this point. Because that blend of size, speed, length, it's impressive. It truly is. The big thing I wanted him to get better at this year was his play strength at the catch point. And the hands have been, have been good. They've been good. But more importantly, how he's been at the contested catch point has been so much better. He's 7 of 10 on the season, putting him at 70%, which is a very good number. He was 2 for 2 against Oregon, and Oregon having these taller corners out of nowhere. These big boys. Uh, he just had a phenomenal game. Like, we need to talk about him in this, in the same, I, I would say, in the same conversation as a uh, Keon Coleman, who had a phenomenal game this week against Syracuse, had probably catch of the week. Uh, Malik Neighbors, Emeka Abuka. He's he is officially, I think, in that tier of wide receivers. As okay, Marvin Harrison Jr. for the most part is like the wide receiver one in this class. I know people want to make an argument that uh, there there might be a contest there. Why well, I don't think much separates uh, a Marvin Harrison from so some of the guys that I just named. I think uh, it, it's enough to say no. He is wide receiver one. But like Odunze, man, he he is he is in the run in here for wide receiver two. This was a phenomenal outing. Of 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 course, we could talk about uh, his teammate who had a phenomenal game as well. Uh, he's been in. He's been on the stock report. Uh, Jalen Polk, who had six catches for 118 yards. I think he had the first touchdown. Uh, but but he did a great job. He he was constantly moving the chains. How many first downs did you have yesterday? He had six. He had six first downs. So that was all of his receptions. Like Polk had a good game. Uh, you we could jump to the other side of the football. Like Troy Franklin did a lot to help out his stock too. Uh, he, he's put on still looks thin and lean, but he put he's put on weight. I think he put on like ten pounds coming into the season. And he has just been tough at the catch point. He uh, he he's a bit more nimble and sharp as a route runner. I think not completely there, but it's trended in the right direction. Like Troy Franklin's honestly a name that we could see at the back end of the first round. Like this, if you didn't know, now you know. This is a really good receiver class, and we're gonna talk about some receivers later on. But I kind of want to stick, uh, just stick with this game. And I mean, sure, I could talk about the quarterbacks, Michael Penix had had himself a day like if you weren't talking about him in the first round you probably should now like i get it the red flag and the medicals that will be a thing but that's all the way at the combine we won't really get real answers and to be fair i mean outside of like <laughs> nfl front offices or maybe some spread like uh some some of the cheat sheets is that what we call them out there no one's really gonna know what's going on a lot of times with some of these uh, guys that get flagged at the combine for injury uh, we don't hear about until we see them falling like a, uh, a Darnell Washington a Corey Trice a uh, uh, who was the center from uh, Maha State last year so it's like even then we might not even really hear anything until it's like okay Michael Penix has fallen but the dude dude's got a huge arm uh, the ball placement, obviously, I think his ac ball, his throw throw accuracy ball placement could be better, but uh, like again, we're kind of like nitpicking here. You're, you're looking at things uh, of why maybe he's not a first rounder because I mean, absolutely at this point, second round. 
Uh, but like again, you're looking at you're you're looking at way reasons you might talk yourself out of taking him in the first. Bo Nix had a great game too. A um, lot, a lot more. Like, I don't know why, but like the Bo Nix haters are so prevalent, even 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 amongst my community. I thought he looked good yesterday. <laughs> I really did, but it is what it is. I, I want to talk about the defensive side of the football in this game. Uh, Brandon Dorless out of Oregon, 6'3", 290, mainly played on the interior in this game. He's going to be an interior player at the next level, but he had five pressures, had a sack, uh, three defensive stops, four pressures. Looked stinking impressive. This guy's firmly a day two. I don't see him uh, going lower than that. He's in his fifth year here at Oregon, former three-star recruit. Uh, imagine I'm going to talk about him when we get to uh, my defensive interior rankings. If you don't know, I'm starting to update all these prospect rankings. We had corner and quarterback last week. Uh, next one out is going to be offensive tackle. So that actually should be tomorrow. So be on the look for that. Uh, but man, the like this dude's motor and play strength are next level. He plays with such hustle, such urgency. He's been really, really good this season, especially uh, in, in some of their bigger matchups like Texas Tech being a close game. Uh, looked good against Colorado. Uh, that's not saying much. They have one of the worst defensive lines. Uh, they're going to have bigger games moving forward here in the Pac-12. So just keep an eye on him if he, I have a hard time believing that he's not been on anybody's radar because I mean we were talking I was talking about this guy last year potentially coming out but then he put on more weight and said no I'm probably just going to be an interior guy now because they were playing him mainly on the edge last season but uh now he had a pretty darn good game for Oregon uh trying to think on Washington's side uh it wasn't like the best game but the dude was a competitor uh Jabari Muhammad for Washington like he was really going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Troy Franklin and sure he had some wins had some losses but he looked really really good uh in in that matchup a uh, former Oklahoma State uh player who transferred after last season so and he, he's actually had a pretty good year uh, statistically thus far uh so someone I, I'm actually pretty excited to dive into but yeah that game was just filled with NFL talent. What can I say? Uh, I knew this would be the next game I watched, though, uh, when I sat down to kind of like do do the stock report. And it was Oregon State versus UCLA. And the player I want to talk about is Oregon State tackle uh, Talisa Uaga. Because this dude's probably a first rounder now. Like he went toe to toe with a very good UCLA defensive line uh a guy like liatu latu like who some people have been talking about as a first rounder um or even a, like a top 15 player uh you had the murphy brothers but fuaga like he allowed one pressure and that was it this guy dominated the game like yeah no he's a first rounder six foot six 334 uh, coming to the year, I was like, hey, yeah, no, dude's a phenomenal, like, road grader. But, like, uh, I thought there were areas he needed to clean up the pass protection uh, against quicker pass rushers. I felt like, you know, he's, he moves solid for being 330 pounds. But, like, there's only so much you can do against those uh, quicker, smaller rushers. But, geez, Louise. This man's hand technique has gotten so much better. How he uses that length, how he uses that those hands, uh, how he's able to control and engage blockers, uh, get into their chest pads and just neutralize them. Like the, the improvement as a pass protector this year has been phenomenal for him. And again, shout out to Alex from Hail Mary Sports. He was kind of the first one on this guy uh, that he was like, oh, dude, this is like my tackle two or something. Like he was in love with him. And I was like, yeah, I think he's fine. I mean, there's areas you need to work on. But I get it. I get why people why people may uh, like him as like a day two. I think I came to the year as a, like a fourth round 
great initially and look at where we're at now that's how sometimes the season plays out man but phenomenal phenomenal uh if you want to know about liatu latu he uh great he only had one pressure that whole game you know i'm pretty confident his win was on joshua gray the left tackle for oregon state who profiles as a guard at the next level like he's pretty good in his own right so don't sleep on gray gray's pretty solid listen i know you love the nfl draft as much as i do and you're gonna want a nice hefty watch list of players during this college football season well go ahead check out my draft guide you can purchase it for only 30 bucks by venmoing or paypaling me links in the description it's a one-time payment and you get it for this whole draft cycle and forever and always technically it's a google spreadsheet so send me your email when you send the payment i'll get you hooked up you will see my current prospect rankings and big board my full evals and guess what it updates throughout the whole draft cycle so it's a great purchase and it's a great way to support the channel uh next this is actually a stock down it's cameron ward out of washington state 6'2 223 he got annihilated by arizona yesterday uh they lost to arizona 44 to 6 at home uh, wait 21 to 29 for 187 yards an interception he had two fumbles and straight up, man, I just feel like he's really regressed the last two weeks. Uh, I feel like we're seeing more of what we saw last year with him, uh, which is really, truly a shame. Uh, he does have eligibility next season. So I don't know if he even comes out. Like, no lie, man, maybe transfer somewhere else. Put that out there. I don't know if he's allowed to. No, he should be. He'll be a graduate at that point. So I don't know, man. Make, make the move to the SEC. Boom gonna put that out there just gonna kind of throw that out there and see who comes a bite in uh i'm trying to think what what spots like kentucky's gonna need a new quarterback with Devin leary gone florida graham Ertz will likely be gone uh on a side note graham Ertz been playing good football recently i'm not saying this guy's like day two or anything but i'm like back end like seventh round or even priority udfa he's definitely in that area but uh, Ward, yeah, man, I think you got to reconsider some things with him. The decision making is not completely great right now, or at least it hasn't been the last couple of games. And honestly, against tougher defense, and this was a defense that uh, for Arizona has been playing a lot of like dollar defense, like uh, they're coming in with like seven, eight defensive backs sometimes. Uh, they bring in the speed on the field, and it, it really neutralized Washington State. It really, truly did. Uh, I mean, while, while we're here talking about bad quarterback performances, Caleb Williams, but hey, man, great, great players have bad games. He had three turnovers in the first half against Notre Dame. That's a very good Notre Dame defense. Truly, truly is. Uh, and yeah, man. Like, he hasn't really looked entirely great thus far this, like, this season, or at least coming out of the bye week. Uh, like, yeah, against Arizona State, Colorado, Arizona, and now Notre Dame. Doesn't really feel like the guy that uh, we, we've we known and loved. Uh, and he was just really careless with the football. This time through the air. I know a lot of people will maybe go and look at his analytics. Like, 12 turnover-worthy plays. A lot of those are fumbles. A lot of those are fumbles. Again, you need to go, like, take those, anal take always take the analytics and then apply them to tape. See what you, like, see what you see. It's like, it's, for me, at least in, in this game, yeah, a lot of it, the deficiencies was with his decision making, uh, but it, that has not been the case for a majority of this season. So let's not act like it has. Uh, always got to add context to the numbers. Uh, but let's go ahead and talk about a rise here in Devont Tez Walker. Tez Walker, I'm so glad to now add him back to my... 2024 big board because initially i had i moved him over to the 2025 because i didn't think he was going to be eligible 
Uh, if you're unfamiliar, big game, by the way, against my Hurricanes. <laughs> uh, six receptions for 132 yards, three touchdowns. Coming in at 6'2", 200 pounds. So, he... The NCAA deemed him not eligible to play because it was technically his second transfer even though he didn't play a snap in 2020 because of it was a Rona year. So let's kind of reel back real quick and I'll kind of talk about him uh, as well. But he's a former three-star recruit from the 2020 class, played basketball, did do uh, track and field in high school as well. Went to North Carolina Central. He didn't play the season because of the because of the Rona. Decided to transfer because he did want to play. Uh, ended up going to Kent State where in 2021 played eight games, but he became the, the starter in 2022 where he made first team all Mac. Decided to transfer because, like, hey, I just had a big year. Let's take this to a power five school. And they were like, oh, well, this is your second transfer. And like, prior to becoming a graduate you know it's not like not like the same thing like if you're if you're a grad transfer you can't you you kind of get you can go to a different school and play immediately uh but it's like this dude didn't play it down for north carolina central they didn't have a year they didn't have a season so it was very unfair uh and that's how a lot of people viewed it they deemed him eligible to play last week he did against i think it was syracuse uh, where he had like eight receptions, but this was like the breakout game. Like, hey, watch me. I'm a legit prospect. Like this dude has great straight line speed for a big receiver can legit tear the top off a of defense. If you go back to 2022, he had eight, eight touchdowns of 20 yards or more. He was clocked in at 23 miles an hour on a screen versus Georgia. This is Kent State versus Georgia that went for 56 yards and a tutty. Uh, he can. He just really can get into a hurry with a really good first step. He can, he's good at eating contact with his frame. Uh, he had 12 forced missed tackles in 2022. Again, we've only seen him through two games thus far this season. Uh, but he contests the catch rate. Already looks much improved. Three for three through two games. Uh, that was kind of something. Uh, that was kind of like my nitpicks with him was he needs to be better at the contested catch. Uh, also, no drops thus far this season. Drops were also something. He was he's in that ten percent range. If you didn't know about eight to ten percent drop rate, you're kind of in that red flag area. You typically want to be lower than ten percent. I, I throw eight percent up there because then it's like okay, it's something you should at least take note of. But ten, it's like what's going on here? Uh, not the most twitchiest player. Not the most sudden mover. More of a straight line guy. Did run a small route tree, and it's not like the route tree is going to get bigger here at North Carolina. But, like, he is just a big vertical threat, can tear the top off of defenses. Uh, he's very technically sound as a run blocker. It's a big reason that Mac uh, Brown wanted to bring him here to North Carolina. And definitely someone to take note of now. That he is eligible to play. I need to make note that uh, he became he became eligible to play at week six. All right. Always gotta love when you're adjusting the notes mid mid video. Uh, we're going to talk about another receiver, one I haven't, I don't think I've talked about yet here on the channel, Ricky Persall, uh, Persail. I think it's Persall, um, out of Florida. He's coming in at 6'1", 192, had 10 receptions this past week against South Carolina, 166 yards, and the touchdown, which was the go-ahead touchdown to give them the lead, to which they would win that game, 41-39 against South Carolina. Uh, this dude's been phenomenal this season. He's going to break his career highs from last season. The dude can legit fly down the field. Just a natural separator. Great flexibility. Like, like this, this dude has shown the ability to make the highlight catch. One of the most sure-handed receivers in this class, guaranteed. He brings almost 
everything thrown to him and he has made some ludicrous catches over his career very shifty receiver who knows how to get skinny through traffic shows creativity uh with shimmies and shakes does have experience on the outside and in the slot uh and as a return man which hey love to see that return experience special teams man that'll get you drafted it truly will uh however i do think he is probably going to be a vertical slot player at the next level like he, he is thin despite you know 192 and just he kind of lacks physicality uh he like he does he can handle press well but he does get like stymed during the during the route he struggles getting leverage in contested catch situations just he, he just project uh projects better as a slot receiver uh something i did notice is he does feel a bit too fancy sometimes with routes does a little too much footwork a little too much dancing and uh that just kind of throws off time into plays here and there so not inherently a bad thing uh but it is something that it's like okay get sometimes you just gotta kind of get to the point uh but i like him a lot man i think he's gonna be a really good day three player uh some people may seem that as a knock i think that's kind of ludicrous like i think if you're a draftable player then then people have a good opinion of you uh i do want to give a shout out didn't put him ne uh, necessarily on the list and he is for sure probably he is a slot only he is someone that's gonna need uh he, like he lacks size it's it's smoke harris from louisiana tech 57 183 he's had a very impressive year uh if he's gonna stick to a team it's probably as a return man don't think he's draftable uh but someone who's having a really good year uh and that probably should be a priority uh udfa i can't wait to really get down uh really get into his eval i've only seen like a couple of games uh of him and i've been like wow man this guy's just kind of a baller okay let's go back to the offensive line with bryce foster out of texas a and m he's actually a stock down player for me uh, coming in at 6'5", 330, play center for the Aggies and just had a bad week. Allowed five pressures on 43 snaps. He had, he was, I believe, was he flagged? Not positive if he was flagged in that game. Can't recall. Uh, but I big reason I, I went back to watch this game is because I was like, I hear really good things about Tennessee's defense, especially the defensive line. Like... First, well, there's Alex from Hammer Sports. He loves Tyler Barron. Uh, but the guy opposite of him, like uh, James Pierce or something, uh, not eligible this year, but a lot of people are giving him a lot of hype as a prospect next season. Uh, and I've heard some good stuff just about the rotation in general there. So I was like, okay, I kind of want to go uh, take a gander uh, at him. So like in the meantime, I was watching Bryce Foster. I was like, man, he's just having a tough go at it. Uh, he is a true junior. He is going to probably return almost guaranteed. And I remember big re like, okay, last year he was hurt. He only played in four games before having a season ended knee injury. But there, I wrote in my preseason eval that there are going to be questions about Foster's commitment to football after kind of choosing to participate in track and field for shot put instead of participating in spring practices. Like I wasn't really worried about it at the time still i'm still i'm still not that worried but it's easy to not be worried if he's playing well and he's just not playing good football right now like he's a dude with a big powerful frame uh that's just his techniques everywhere he doesn't make utilization of that power he does possess and it just it shows it really does so someone that needs just more polish really uh, and just kind of want to give him a shout out here because I think he did he he made my preseason uh, interior player rankings and just want to give y'all a reason why you're not gonna see him on there on the update. Uh, moving to the uh, defensive side of the football, uh, we're gonna talk quick about Javante Jean uh, Baptiste. I think I got it. Uh, out of Notre Dame. So I haven't wrote an eval for him. 
just someone that's kind of caught my eye as I watched my uh, Riley Mills and Howard Cross. Uh, but I was like, okay, he seems all right, man. He's getting pressure, and like I, I don't think he's, I don't think he's like a, I don't see him as like a, a round one through four guy. I think he, we're definitely talking about the mid to late for uh the mid to late rounds when it comes to the draft. Uh, but someone who's definitely being productive. And I was like, okay, let me go. Let me let me see uh, the journey here because I noticed he didn't have really a ton of snaps or he didn't really have a lot of starts to his uh, repertoire. And he was actually a four-star recruit from the 2018 class where he went to Ohio State, red-shirted, uh, and really was just kind of a key rotation player there for a good amount of years until last season where he started the year heavy utilizing the rotation and then just started losing snaps to younger players. So as a graduate, he transfers to Notre Dame, getting an opportunity to start, and he has been really good. He had a field day against <laughs> Caleb Williams and company where he had seven pressures, should have had a sack or two. There was one where uh, just Caleb got away from him. And I mean, it's stinking Caleb Williams. Yeah, he's hard to wrap up. It is what it is. Uh, but no, it's been an impressive outing coming in at 6'4", 260. He's going to get an all-star circuit, uh, which could help his draft. Well, I imagine it will help his draft game great quite a bit. I don't know if I see him in a like a round three or round four, but like as a maybe five, six, seven guy, I think I think that's probably where he's going to end up being at. Uh, and I'm going to try to watch a little bit uh, more of him. I'm going to go back to the USC Notre Dame game. I kind of just, I didn't like sit down and sit down, watch that game with the, with the, with the, I guess what the, the purpose of evaluating guys. I was just enjoying it, and I was like, "Oh man, this guy's getting after it." So uh, I'm hopefully gonna go uh, go and do that this week. Uh, going to Anissa Isaac out of Penn State. I know it's UMass, but this guy deserves a shout out. He's playing really good football. He had a big game against Northwestern the prior week. Played good against Illinois. Him and Chop Robinson. Chop Robinson, he gets all of the love. Let me let go, Joe. Apparently, he wants to talk edge players. Come on in here. Apparently, uh, Gojo, you want to talk edge players? You want to talk edge players, buddy? Come up here. Nah, you're, you're chilling there. Uh, But, yeah, no, man. Th this cat deserves a little bit of love. Because I think he's going to find himself drafted somewhere between the third and fifth rounds. Uh, I'm, I'm just kind of getting that feeling. I, I've, I've moved him up to a fifth round prospect since. Uh, like th this dude, well, for one, coming in at 6'4", 254, got a very good first step. Who would have thought? Next to Chop Robinson, you think you, you, I guess you just looks a little bit slower, but no, man, like him and Chop, they are, they have in, insane burst, insane twitch, insane closing speed. Uh, I mean, he does a really good job of setting tackles up and they kind of hit him with this slick little Euro step and then a dip move. Uh, he just bends really, really well. Uh, he has the speed to actually drop back into coverage. He actually did that last season 48 times. That was kind of cool, but plays with a big motor. Uh, I will say though, I, I He's improved as a run defender this year, but I don't trust him to consistently win the point of attack. As uh, I, I don't, he just doesn't have the meatiest frame. At least it doesn't look that way. Despite okay, listen to six four two fifty four. That shouldn't be like. Yeah, no, that that's that's a good size. But I'm, I look at him and I'm like, doesn't look like the meatiest guy. It might be just because he's jacked to the to the gills. Uh, more of a dive and drag tackler. It's been a bit more consistent for him this season. So not bad, but he was formerly a four-star recruit from the 28, 2019 class, excuse me. Uh, and I mean, if we want to go back 2021, he had an ankle surgery where he had red shirt that year where it required like eight months of rehab. So kind of kind of big there, but had a big game against UMass. UMass is not that good, but... 
someone I just haven't shouted out yet this season, and I really feel like I should because uh, he's one heck of a good player. Really, one heck of a good player. And then last but not least, I'm going to give a shout out to Cade Stover. Yeah, we're going to tight end real quick. Uh, and I, I got a shout out, Cade Stover. Coming in at 6'4", 251. I'll briefly talk about him in a little bit, but uh, he had a good game where he had four receptions, 53 yards, two touchdowns. One of them was pretty nasty where like, he just grabs the ball in the uh, end. It was like in the middle of the uh, middle of, not middle of the field, but was at the goal line in, uh, in the middle of the field there. It just kind of like, ah, like rips it out from uh, another defender, I believe. And this tight end class, we look at Brock Bowers and then we're like, that's it. Like, okay, Jatavion Sanders is fine, but am I taking him in the first? No. Okay, well, what other day two tight ends are there? And you're like, well, I guess Sanders. Uh, Luke, Luke Lackey is... Fine, fine, probably a third round guy. Like, Kate Stover is the other guy right now that's kind of emerging. Uh, ben Sinnott, uh is playing well too, but he has some certain, he has some limitations where I kind of question um, how early he can go. But, like, Stover is hella good. Former four star recruit. Again, we're going to briefly go over backstory here. Uh, former four-star recruit from the 2019 class. Played running back, linebacker, defensive line in high school. Uh, he is also he is also his high school's all-time leading scorer uh, in, uh, in football, I guess. Uh, no, yeah, football. Uh, he's a farm boy and credit. Okay, I think I've said this before, but he credits former Buckeye Jonathan Cooper, now on the Broncos, as who he modeled himself after to become a leader for Ohio State. Uh, he showed up at Columbus as a defensive end, but made the move to tight end after he redshirted uh, his freshman season. And this was a dude that primarily played on special teams going into the 2022 seasons where he kind of put his name on the map. And if anything, the thing that he has improved most this season are the ball skills. Because you go back to Mich 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 yeah, Michigan versus Ohio State. And he had some, like he had, he had one bad drop that should have been a touchdown, was knocked away. Good play by the slot corner uh, for Michigan. Mike, uh, it's like Saint Strill, or I can't remember his last name, but uh, it was good play by him. But like, you're a tight end. You should have been, you should have stronger hands than that. And I know he has stronger hands. Uh, there was one where it was just out of his reach because he goes to dive out for it. Just the dude. They'd have consistent ball skills. Uh, I mean, what, last season, contested catch rate was fine. It was 44%. Not great, but uh, it's fine enough. It's not bad. Uh, the drop rate analytically wasn't bad, but mm, guy that did sometimes was a body catcher. But, like, this season, I feel like he's so much more improved. And, in, and this is a tight end class. I need someone to step up. That's not Brock Bowers. Like, Jatavion Sanders has kind of had his ups and downs. I'm not saying Stover's kind of on the, on that level in terms of, like, like because Sanders is a phenomenal pass catcher. Like, Stover ain't, ain't going to be that, but Stover's game is a lot more all around. But I want to give him a shout-out, man. This tight end class has kind of been lackluster this season if you, your name's not Brock, Brock Bowers. And I think Stover is a guy that, at least for me, has really helped himself. Uh, I think he's probably in like tight end three or four for me right now. But uh, that's it for the video. Go ahead, do that YouTube thing. And as always, until next time, you be easy, my friends. Later.